your brain is pretty amazing. Its computing capabilities are, in many metrics, far beyond the biggest supercomputer. Your visual processing center can track and identify tens of thousands of things at a split second and parse information from text at a glance. At the same time, it took many years for one of the largest companies in the world to parse digital text from scanned pages. Your language processing center can parse sounds, words, to sentences, to meaning, while automatic translation is just barely functional. Deep learning and neural networks are built on the idea that the brain is vastly better at solving problems than any algorithm we have been able to conjure, so why not try to copy whatever it is that the brain is doing? It's probably comically simple for you to see that this is the digit 4. And even though the individual pixel values are very different, it is no harder to recognize any of these images as the digit 4 either while confidently classifying these as not being the digit 4. However, if given the task to take a 28 by 28 pixel image of a digit and correctly classifying it using some programmatic algorithm, most would probably barely know where to even begin. In this video, I will describe a neural network from the ground up and explain what it means for such a network to learn. Let us begin by trying to solve the problem of classifying digits using neural networks for ourselves. We'll start at the end and work backward. A nice way to represent a classification is to assign each class a number between 0 and 1, representing the probability of the input belonging to that class. In this case, we would want 10 classes, 0 through 9. These numbers are called neurons and are, in reality, nothing more than that, something that stores a number. If we feed our solution an image of the digit 4, we want the fourth neuron to have a value close to 1, and the other neurons to be close to 0. Now, we are not much closer to solving the problem, of course. To continue, we will use one of the most useful strategies in complex problem solving, breaking the problem down into subproblems. Let's say we had another set of neurons with values between 0 and 1, signifying the existence of some useful pattern in the data. For example, one neuron could represent the existence of a circle at the bottom of the image, while another might signify a straight line on the left side of the image. Then one could identify certain combinations of patterns to indicate a specific digit. For example, a circle at the bottom and a line on the left may signify the digit 6 while two circles may signify an 8. Ignoring for a second the glaring issue of how you would find these patterns in the image in the first place, let us instead consider how one would compute the class-wise probability of each digit given these patterns. Take the digit 6 as an example. A natural solution is to assign each pattern neuron a weight and compute the weighted sum. A large positive weight is then saying that that pattern is a positive indicator of the digit 6, while negative values are negative indicators, and weights close to 0 are patterns that are not strong indicators. Now, we wanted numbers between 0 and 1, and this sum, as written, depending on the weights, can be any real number. What we want is to squish the possible outcomes to the range 0 to 1 using what is known as an activation function. The sigmoid function, which maps the real line to exactly the desired range, fits the job neatly. This maps to 0.1 if the sum is 0. One may want to shift this such that, for example, the sum needs to be at least 1 before the activation is 0.1. In order to do this, we simply add a constant term to the sum, known as the bias. And that's it. If we carefully find the right weights and biases, we would be able to go from the patterns to a classification of the digit 6. If we repeat this for every digit, we get what is known as a fully connected neural layer, the backbone of neural networks. Zooming out we can actually represent this whole layer very neatly. So neatly, in fact, that you might feel like we massively overcomplicated something very trivial. 
if we collect the weights as columns in our matrix W, the biases in a vector B and call the input X, this whole step reduces to the matrix operations X times W plus B, wrapped in a sigmoid activation function. That's it, just a linear matrix operation wrapped in a nonlinear activation function. Don't get disheartened, however. This is entirely on purpose. The simple design makes computations extremely efficient and choosing the right weights and biases much easier. Now we face three problems. How do we choose the weights and biases? How do we decide which patterns are relevant? And finally, how do we find these patterns in the image? It seems like we've just kicked the problem down the road and created a few more issues along the way. Luckily, if we keep going with the last point, the other two will solve themselves. The problem we face now is very similar to the original one, but perhaps a tad simpler. It's still just pattern recognition. So can we do the same thing again? Assume a set of patterns and find combinations. Then we've reduced the problem again to just finding some short line segments at different angles and places. In other words, we have added another fully connected layer to our network. Extrapolating into the future, one might imagine that the next step is to break these patterns into even smaller sub-patterns. However, these patterns are already so simple that breaking them into smaller patterns doesn't make much sense. Instead, we could treat the image itself as the input patterns from which we find combinations. We would flatten the input to 784 input neurons and add another fully connected layer between the input and the last set of patterns. It is not hard to convince yourself that given the right set of patterns and the right set of weights and biases, this structure is able to classify digits. A second observation you may make is that the problem of choosing the right patterns is actually the same as choosing the right weights and biases. The weights and biases of the network entirely define the patterns it extracts and analyzes from the input image. In order to progress, we need to face a harsh reality. The network will in all likelihood not behave in this nice and explainable way. It is a useful simplification to understand why networks are built in layers and how deeper networks can reason about more complex concepts. Yes, it is a nice idea that each neuron represents a specific pattern, but they are not required to do so. In fact, I encourage you to shake off this notion of patterns that has been so useful to us so far and instead think of each layer as providing the network an increasingly intricate understanding of the input data. Without the concept of patterns, we are left with just without the concept of patterns, we are left with without the concept of patterns, we are just left with tuning the weights. Without the concept of patterns, we are left with just Without the concept of patterns, we are left with just tuning the weights and biases such that the network classifies each digit correctly. This is done through what is known as training. Step one of training is to choose some metric you want to optimize. When not necessary, it is common to make it so the metric is better the lower it is, with optimal being zero. The choice of metric is far from arbitrary and may heavily influence the speed of training and the final performance. A common loss function for classification is categorical across entropy. Next, we feed the network an image for which we know what the digit is. The network will make a prediction on which we evaluate the loss function. Then we go through all the weights and biases of the network and tune them such that the loss decreases. This process is repeated until some termination condition is reached. And voila, you've successfully solved the very hard problem of recognizing digits from images. Let us once again introduce the patterns we so hastily discarded. This time with the understanding that they are just a helpful tool, not a fundamental truth. The fully connected neural layer is pretty inefficient at analyzing images. Firstly, we need a bunch of neurons dedicated to finding the same pattern at different positions. It would be much more efficient to have a single set of weights that looked for a pattern anywhere in the image and somehow stored the position of each of that pattern it found. 
In a sense, a circle is a circle regardless of its position in the image. This would vastly reduce the number of weights required to interpret an image. A second inefficiency is that patterns are usually very local. A circle remains a circle regardless of the value of some pixel on the other side of the image. To find that circle, you only need to look at a small region of the image. The fully connected layer, on the other hand, looks at every single pixel in the image. A more efficient solution maybe only looks at neighboring pixels. This is all remedied by the convolutional neural layer. Without going into too much detail, instead of the entire W matrix, the convolutional neural layer is defined by small filters that are swept across the image, like this. This produces another image where each pixel is the sum of the corresponding region in the input multiplied by the filter. This is repeated to produce multiple channels or features. After a number of convolutional neural layers, each pixel in a channel can be thought of as encoding a pattern at a specific position. This has successfully solved the issues we found in the fully connected neural layer, but not without a cost. It's much harder to control the exact shape of the output of the network, and the network needs to go very deep to be able to look at large patterns. Since the result of a convolutional neural network is always another image, ending up with just 10 values for the classification is pretty hard. One common solution is to pass the output to a fully connected neural network, though modern techniques bypass this step. So far, we've only looked at classification, mostly because this is a very intuitive task. In reality, neural networks are far more versatile than that. In the description below, there are links to other videos about solving microscopy problems using deep learning. If any of them seem interesting to you, please watch them. But first, I encourage you to watch the next video in the series on the Python framework DeepTrack.